Welcome to Finlow's Lives. I want to start by saying thank you for joining me. I know it's been a little bit since my last post, but life has been happening. And as I try to get back into a good routine, I just want to remember that good routines are all about good habits. And even if this might turn out to be a shorter episode, it feels good just to be talking and recording again. So again, thank you for joining me. And I'm going to be spending most of this episode kind of reflecting on my 41st birthday, which just passed recently, September 14th. And it feels a little redundant, I guess, because I did something similar at New Year. But again, I think that reflection is always a good practice. And if I'm using this podcast as a form of accountability for both myself and for any potential audience member to be aware of the things that I'm doing, then I think it serves a purpose. So, again, thank you. But yeah, it was my 41st birthday, and uh, it was a little bit of a sentimental number for me at 41. When I was, when I was growing up, my father and I used to bond by watching biblical epics, or just epics in general. So, uh, we watched Spartacus, and Ten Commandments, and I think my favorite of all of these classics was uh, Ben-Hur, the Charlton Heston classic. And he's a trash person, and, you know, I don't mean to speak ill of the dead, but uh, regardless, I, I have a soft spot in my heart for these old movies. But anyways, specifically, this relates to uh, Ben-Hur because there's a part in the film where the main character, Judah Ben-Hur, is taken captive and made a slave and he serves on a Roman, um, I forget what the type of boat it's called, but it's it's, it's one of these, I think a trireme maybe, um, one of these old antique style boats where it's powered both by sail and by uh, oarsmen and so the Charlton Heston character Ben-Hur he was in spot number 41 and so the the Roman owner slash ship captain whatever you want to call him general I don't know it's been a while since I've watched it he would refer to the Ben-Hur character as number 41 and so it was. It's, it's always kind of been an inside joke for my father and I um, when we want to just have that moment of like, yeah, we both spent time watching this movie. It's a good movie. We would look at each other and say, are you there, number 41? <laughs> so anyways, on my birthday, my dad called me and he said, are you there, number 41? And so that was a, a good moment for me. It, it was a good birthday. Because it's an opportunity. And I and I and I look for any opportunity to think about ways that I can grow and learn. And I think that we use and, I, and I've spoken about how birthdays, New Year, it, it, they're arbitrary, but they they are signifiers of this uh, cycle, an annual cycle, which I think is is a very effective means of of keeping track and of reflecting on ways that we've grown and ways that we'd still like to grow and we all celebrate a little bit differently some of us don't care much for their birthdays or 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 see it as an important day others of us long for the attention and to be celebrated Uh, i fall somewhere on the reclusive side i don't uh, lots of attention makes me really uncomfortable but, of course, I like to be loved and I like to be shown care. So I, it's, a, it's an interesting challenge that I set for Eva every year and for people who want to show me that they love me on my birthday. But I don't want you to go out of your way to plan things or to, to make great shows because it makes me really nervous and uncomfortable. And I don't like the feeling of, of feeling like people are going out of their way. It's just I'm, I'm a weird person like that. But 
Eva always accepts these challenges with grace and with great success. And so like, like every other birthday, I feel loved and I feel as if the people who care made it known to me and they showed up for me in their own individual way. So special thanks to everybody who took a moment out of their day to well wish me and let me know that they thought of me and it is it is one of the greatest ways to to show love at least for me like just to know that i'm being thought of honestly but i do have to take note that there were a few folks who did decide to give me some gifts they were very thoughtful and so i, I do want to shout them out of course eva who knows me best made for me a cheesecake that is usually my preference for celebratory torts or cakes on my birthday is a cheesecake and to and, and sorry this year it was double chocolate espresso cheesecake and it is hands down without a doubt it was probably the best cheesecake i've ever had in my entire life and that's saying a lot because as Yuki comes down, out down the stairs, because Eva has made some mean cheesecakes and all of the best cheesecakes have all been made by Eva in my experience. And I've had some really good cheesecakes from restaurants, but Eva makes an amazing cheesecake. But um, not to make you too jealous about that, but it was, I think my best description that I had for it was, it's like a cheesecake and mousse and fudge had a three-way baby. That was the texture of it. Uh, it was just absolutely spectacular. In addition, Eva also got me a new tarot deck. And uh, I, I collect things and it's a problem. But I've, I've sort of narrowed down my collecting to a couple of areas. One of them being tarot cards. So Eva got for me a Star Trek The Next Generation tarot deck. And it's really, really cool. So I look forward to getting to work with that and getting to know those cards. Uh, Ray got me a really cool bird book, which uh, I really enjoy bird watching. It's one of my meditative practices. I like to get out in the mornings and um, and listen to bird calls. And there's an app called Merlin, which is amazing because you can you can give descriptions of birds by their colors and by their behaviors and by their, their where they're grazing or however birds feed what's the word for that scratching <laughs> i don't know what the phrase for it is you can also rec record and it can identify birds by their their calls so there's probably about between a dozen and maybe 20 fairly common birds that 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 are vocal in the mornings and evening evenings around our house that I've become pretty familiar with and I can identify by ear. Um, so anyways, that uh, birding for me is a very relaxing way to start the day. But um, Ray got me a book called The Field Guide to Dumb Birds of the Whole Stupid World. And it's this fabulous little beautifully crafted, uh, it's got gorgeous artwork in it. It's all um, painted and, and illustrated. But instead of giving you, like, <laughs> it has the scientific names, but it also has these very amusing names based upon some of their qualities or, or behaviors, which I really like. So I'm going to turn to a page at random and give you uh, whatever that name might be, including if it happens to be some bad words, but they're, they, they are worth it. So uh, I'm looking at right now the Yellow Bill Oxfucker, which is a good one, or the California Smug Jerk which is another great name. And let's see, what else can we come up with here? <laughs> Instead of a toucan, it's called a tacky poo can, tacky poo can. And uh, creepy skull bird because the face has no feathers, so just a creepy skull bird. Anyways, it, it's, it's a fun book, so I really appreciate that for both the art and the humor. And um, Anna recognizes that it's been a lifelong interest and in the past few years 
I've made some attempts, all of them having failed miserably, but I would I, I, I would love to have a, a very small, modest uh, collection of bonsai trees, and I've, I've not yet succeeded in either growing them from like native little saplings or I've purchased pre pre-grown saplings with the intent of, of, of nurturing them into these little bonsai trees and I'm just terrible at it and I, I would like to do it someday but I'm not there yet but Anna thoughtfully who has gotten me several junipers or other you know very practical easy to grow bonsai trees all of which I've murdered but this year for my birthday Anna got me a lego bonsai which is totally cool that's something I can do and it can also be uh, a meditative practice as I assemble the very complicated uh, Lego set. And with it, um, it, it, they also got me, if you've seen the the film uh, by Studio Ghibli, the um, mm, Princess Mononoke, uh, when they're in the forest and the little Kodama tree spirits, they like their heads. Anyways, to go with my bonsai, and I got me these little glow-in-the-dark Kodamas to go with it. So thank you for that. And I treated myself to a new tattoo, which has become something of a birthday tradition for me over the past few years uh, with Eva's assistance. Eva and I went to go see our tattoo artist, Lauren, who's a, who's a former student um, and with whom Eva has become really close as, as a uh, spiritual and, and herbalist practitioner, as well as studying. I'm, I'm the words are escaping me. I'm sorry. Uh, the the indigenous people of the of the Caribbean, the Taino, one of the indigenous groups, they they are learning together about those cultures. But um, Lauren designed for me a beautiful tattoo. Uh, it's a tarot card inspired tattoo, and so I'll, I'll share a picture of that if you haven't already seen it. Anyways, it was a really nice birthday. I feel loved, and I feel attended to and cared for in all the ways that. Are good and make me feel loved so thank you everybody for helping me to celebrate so anyways at the risk of being redundant i'm gonna take some time to reflect on what this past year what this most recent trip around the sun, what life after 41 rotations feels like, and uh, what do I think that I've, I don't know, achieved, accomplished, how have I grown in the past 365 days? So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to spend some time talking. And so uh, to reflect and to consider where I think I might, I might be the most proud is my, my relationships, especially with the people who are the most immediate to me, that being Eva, my partner and our two kids and relationships are really hard. I mean, all relationships are hard, but especially I think intimate long-term relationships can feel the hardest because they are the most important in that we rely on them the most for emotional support and for being able to vent and reflect and ask questions and get the types of support that we need most. And yet so often because they are safe and comfortable and familiar, they, they, they might be taken for granted and perhaps not given as much attention as other types of relationships. Uh, the 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 joke that Eva and I like to use is they have, we we have old relationship energy uh, in contrast to new relationship energy. And as we as we see people entering relationships and and basking in the, basking in that new relationship energy glow, yeah, it, it's nice to see, and we're we're excited for them, but. I think we, we are actually much more comfortable and much more proud of our old relationship energy and how we continue to let our relationship mature and hopefully 
uh, nurture it and and allow it to grow. And I neglected this for years, I think. Um, you know, we've, we've been together now for more than 20 years. And uh, I, I definitely have fallen into that rut of taking that relationship as a, as a gimme, as a, as a grant, as a for granted. And damn near lost it. And so I'm really proud, especially in the past 12 months, how much work we have put into building friendship with each other, building trust with each other, and making sure that the assumption that we have that the that each other will, will, will be there for will be there for each other that that assumption is based on reality that it's not just because we're partners that we just think it's going to happen and so i'm really proud of that we have done a lot of work in terms of maintaining the vitality of our relationship the love and support that we feel for one another especially as we continue to raise our, our kids and hopefully doing so in ways that are interrupting the the transmission of traumas from one generation to the next you know and, and to use the cliched image r relationships have sparks they have that that flame that you have to keep alive and i, I feel that our spark is much bigger than it has at different times in the past and it's a, it's a, it's a, to continue this analogy, it's a stronger, brighter, warmer spark. And it's not like, uh, like we're not burning down forests with our new relationship energy, but we have that, uh, I'm really going to extend this metaphor. We have the, the benefits of that, of, of a controlled burn where you, you clear the underbrush to make the forest happy and healthy. That, that, I think that's a really, a really powerful analogy. I, I like that. But we have definitely have room to grow. I do, definitely, as far as communication goes. I think it's really easy to not communicate because communication requires risk and vulnerability. And, and you know, I haven't always been willing to do that. I haven't always been willing to... to open up in the ways that I need to when I'm feeling depressed or when I'm feeling anxiety or when there's needs that are not being met or when I want to try something else to add a new experience, anything. Uh, I have not always been great about that. So I'm definitely continuing to, to work on that, especially when it comes to, to defensiveness, because it's so easy to hear a truth and be hurt by it because it might not be the prettiest truth or it might not be the exact truth that you want it to be. And so those shields go right up and, and we, we, we start throwing out claims and, and, and ways of, def of, of deflecting and whatever it is you want to say about, about how, how we behave when, when, when we're feeling defensive, and that's definitely also, if you listen to uh, the episode about toxic masculinity, I think that's definitely a, something that I'm that I'm working to to diminish. That when my partner says something to me that is the truth, it's 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 being told to to help me to do less harm and to grow. And then I think also I'm really proud of how we are being considered of, e of each other's evolving needs as this relationship continues for so long, as we really lean into what it means to be in a lifelong relationship and how it's unfair to expect that any one person would be able to meet all of our needs for each other, that we consider what those evolving needs look like and how, how do we, especially me as a, a very... Mm, less social introvert might need to to be able to have quiet time and time to myself to do things like this. So um, I'm I'm really proud of where we are. This year uh, in July was the one year anniversary of or the first anniversary of 
me starting this new job and I still miss the classroom terribly. I still really feel as if I have a lot to offer as an educator, as a teacher. But I've been I've had some 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 really interesting moments with this job this year, especially in the past maybe two or three months, where a year in, you know, everybody keeps what everybody has told me in the in in the work that I'm doing, especially the the leadership of the teams that I've worked on, is assessment construction. You know, can take two, sometimes three years to really get good at it, and so I'm only a year into it, but I'm starting now to really bear the full responsibility of my position, where I'm I'm you know left to do the work that I need to get done, and it's been really hard, and it's been hard. Not because I don't have the skills, because I'm really good at, at what I do. But as a classroom teacher, I think one of the ways in which I thrived is that I'm really good at thinking on my toes and meeting the immediate needs of my students and how, how I meet the sort of long-term goals that I have for any sort of uh, instructional routine that I'm going through which meant that I oftentimes didn't really have long-term lesson plans because I knew the content so well, because I knew the standards so well, because I knew my students so well, I could, I could build the content as I went. And because most of the time I was on a team of ELA teachers, English language arts teachers, so we were on a team in terms of like vertical and horizontal planning, so uh, grade level planning and, and honors, AP planning, et cetera, et cetera, in a, in a macro scale. But when it came to what was happening in my classroom, I was the teacher. Like I taught these sections and there wasn't really anybody else who was teaching the same thing as me. So I was very independent and had a lot of autonomy. As long as I was meeting the goals, as long as my assessment scores were fine, as long as the parents were happy, as long as the administration was happy, as long as my students were learning and showing progress, I was, it was great. And I was really good at that. And so while the skills themselves have transitioned without a problem into this new job, where I've actually found that I have the most difficulty is functioning as part of a team. Not because I'm, I don't like my coworkers because actually I really enjoy my teammates and not because I'm not good at working with people because I really am. Like I take, I take instructions well, I can delegate, I can receive delegation, all of that. It's fine. But when we are working on long-term projects and, and all of the projects that we work on are long-term where they're, they're, it's cyclical development, it requires a level, of inter, a level of integration between team members that I, was, I am just not used to. And it is really hard because we all work slightly differently. We all work at different paces. And... For me, as long as I'm meeting a deadline, it's great. But for other people, they need to be ahead of the of ahead of schedule so that they feel safe and comfortable. And so to be able to work as part of this team has required me to stretch and grow in a lot of ways that that has been a really big challenge for me. And I think that I am getting better. But it's definitely something that is that it's going to continue to be a struggle for me. That I'm continuing to learn how to not be a team player, but to be a part of a team. And I think that it's a subtle distinction to make there. And I don't exactly know what the distinction is because I can be a part of a team and I've been a part of a team. But now that I'm at the same level in terms of all of the other teammates, I have to be in sync with them. And that's that's been tricky. But I do like the job and I really do enjoy the people that I work with. And I think that it is allowing me to sort of develop skills that I've never had to use before because all of the work that I've always done has never required it. I've never had to, to do it in this way. So that's, that's exciting. It's different and it's hard and hard is good. Unfortunately, because of the intensity of work sometimes and because of our busy schedules because we try to keep everything active and we try to have lots of extracurriculars for the kids and for ourselves i haven't had as much time for for this for 
for my creative process and podcasting and things like that, which is something that I have that I have missed. And so my podcasts have slowed down a little bit, though it, it's really always on my mind. Like I'm always considering what would be a good idea. How can I take this experience that I'm having in life, shape into something that might be interesting for people to listen to, and also just just make it valuable for myself as a tool for reflection. So I definitely think that while my output has slowed down a little bit, especially in the past six months, the episodes that I'm putting out, I think are really good. And I'm absolutely proud of, of, of what's available. And also the, the episodes that are co-hosted by Eva, the, 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 the Finless Loves episodes, those are so good. (laughs) I actually, I listen to them sometimes as I work, just, I have them on because it's just, it's really nice to hear those conversations and it's just, it's just cool. I'm proud of that work. And I, and I'm so thankful that Eva is willing to, to play with me in that way, because this, this does very much feel like play for me. And I hope to hopefully reciprocate by, this is sort of going back to the conversation about relationships, but I hope to be able to reciprocate by making the types of conversations that we have for those episodes also be the types of conversations that we have every day in real life because it's not always true it's interesting how those personas are they are real this is really who i am and when you hear me speaking this is really who i am but it doesn't always that's not always how it, it i show up in person so that's something i should work on i think but i do have some really what will hopefully be fun ideas for the podcast in the next by my next birthday we'll say um i have some ideas relating to both uh, music and personal narrative and how music and food and how we link these sort of sensory experiences of sound and taste to memory formation and how we build our 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 our, our biographies around these things so i would like to get back into interviewing people and then evolving those interviews to include these sort of multi-dimensional sensory conversations about how our stories, how, how we organize our stories in our minds around the senses. I'm specifically thinking food and music and sound because those are my things, but I don't see why it couldn't also go to like other senses, like the sensation of running your hands across something or seeing this particular shade of blue, you know, whatever we want to talk about with whoever those people are. But if you have ideas, and you want to want to be on the show? Let me know. So, I'm definitely going to continue into the long run. Uh, I I've, I've read statistics about podcasts, and I don't like I'm I'm not a I don't keep up with trends and what's popular because I don't care. But uh, I do. I am very proud that most people who intend to have an ongoing podcast, like as a show, make it seven episodes or less before falling out with it either because they just get too busy or because whatever whatever so as i'm now almost two full years into it i'm i'm very happy to say that i've beat that record so thank you for continuing to listen and then i guess the last thing that i want to reflect on from the past year is um my internal mental and physical well-being and the ways in which I still tend to neglect them and how I have begun to, to, to do better. I think mental, my mental health has, has improved um, about, I don't know how many months ago it will be at, at this point. It'll probably be about three months ago. I decided to, to modify my, my uh, prescription regime as far as like uh, an antidepressant that I was taking from a few years back when I was, stopping drinking and all of these things. And so this was a tool that I was using to sort of help regulate. And I, and I felt as if I've reached a phase in my life where because of undesirable side effects and just because of the way that I have been able to adopt skills that I've learned in therapy and just skills that I've been practicing that I don't, I don't need that, that medication anymore. And so about three, about three months ago, I, I began weaning myself off. And so I'm now completely off of that medication. And it was rough going because of the side effects of cessation of 
the antidepressant with those um, withdrawal symptoms of sleep interruption and headaches and mood weirdness and stuff like that. But I think I'm, I'm, I'm finally evening out. And then the good thing is what I'm actually finding is that, as one would expect, the, the full range of feelings have returned. And how I can both, both most easily know that is I laugh and I cry both a lot more than I was which is a good thing which means that the that the old the old uh emotions are, are st they're still there and they're flowing that's really nice but I think more difficult for me has been making sure to to tend to my physical health because this new job is so sedentary and I'm sitting most of the time and I'm a bored I'm a boredom eater so if I'm if I'm just kind of hanging around and not really doing much I'll, I'll just go grab a snack and I'll just do that throughout the day. So very recently, maybe 10 days, 15 days, I don't exactly know how many days it is. I, I've definitely taken a conscious move towards healthier eating. And what that really looks like for me is very little uh, unhealthy snacks, like no processed snacks, eating lots of nuts. And um, and I've, I'm a really huge fan of, of kefir. And so I drink that a lot and it's helping. I feel good. And some of the pounds are starting to come off, and so I'm excited about that. Next up for me is uh, having a regular exercise routine. So getting into that. Um, when I was at my healthiest about 10 years ago, I was jogging five or six miles a day, and I weighed a lot less than I do now. And I don't want to get to that point because I, I think that I was overdoing things a little bit, but I definitely want to get back into the practice of jogging and and exercising regularly so i think maintaining this growth on reflect on on how i feel both emotionally and physically because there's always change happening and having the capacity to to grapple with and respond in, in healthy ways is really important so let's look ahead into what's going to happen in my 42nd year, which I'm now um, about 15 days into my 42nd year. And, uh, you know, as always, I want to do those SMART goals. Thank you, Eva. They are specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time limited. So, you know, there's some short term, some medium term, some long term goals, but I think something that's going to be really important for me is that I continue to develop and then maintain the sustainable and practical meditative practices. Things that allow me to connect and ground and just sort of be present in moments and not always be so caught up in the stresses of work or the daily grind of making sure everybody's where they need to be on time and things like that. So taking time to slow down and think and feel and process. And so the ways that, that I'm really going to lean into are the things that I already do, but just doing them more, more regularly and putting some of these tarot decks that I have into practice and putting some of these microphones that I have into practice with recording. And so just not even with the intention of, of, of producing anything with it or of anything coming out of it, just recording stuff and, and using that as my form of journaling. Uh, if anybody who knows me knows that I hate journaling, but this is this is a little bit easier for me. And then to pair with that uh, sustainable and practical physical health practices. Uh, Vivienne really enjoys rock climbing, as do I. So I went today and hopefully will be able to do that more frequently. I, like I said before, I also want to really get back into my jogging routine. I think jogging for me is easy and sustainable once I get going because I enjoy jogging it really that really is a is a good grounding process for me but it's really that the getting over that first really difficult phase of just conditioning but um I really want to do that continuing healthy eating being very mindful of what we're putting into our bodies as a family much more fresh stuff and and utilizing all of the things that we're producing in our garden for sure and then my least favorite some sort of stretching because <laughs> I went to a, a chiropractor for the first time a couple weeks ago because I was experiencing a lot of pain. And as he was 
doing some sort of stretching maneuver on my legs. He said, oh man, you are so tight in your legs. <laughs> and uh, he was actually worried he was going to hurt me. So that's interesting. But I hate, I hate stretching. I hate yoga. I actually have a whole comedy routine in my mind about yoga and how it's not really actually good for us. It's actually a form of like, I don't know, personal sadism or something like that. But um, I definitely need to stretch more because things hurt. And I'm not young, but I'm also not old. And so I shouldn't feel this much pain. And all of that really leads into this continuing to nurture a healthy relationship with myself because I have a tendency towards self-loathing and self-destructive behaviors, especially when I'm bored. It's not that I really don't like myself. I, it's just I'm very hard on myself. And when I make mistakes, which of which I make a lot, I, I tend to sort of just beat myself up and and see these as signs that I'm not worthy of whatever you want to say, uh, not worthy of love or care or affection or of the things that I have in my life, blah, 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 blah. So just making sure to continue that the, the conversation with myself about what my needs are and if I'm in a negative mental space, why am I in that space? And how can I not, how can I, what can I do to, to better it? And some of the easiest ways for me to achieve that, to, to go back to the SMART goals, is to not procrastinate because I'm a procrastinator. So making sure to do the things that I need to do as I need to do them. That I avoid boredom eating. So if I'm just sitting around and I have a moment or two to not, not where I'm not active, instead of eating something, doing something taking a walk or walking the dog or going for a quick jog up and down the street, whatever it is. And then not repressing my food, my, <laughs> my foods, not repressing my moods and my emotions. I tend to not talk about especially negative emotions or negative feelings because I have an aversion to feeling like I'm a burden on people. And I often work under the assumption that if I'm if I'm if I'm in a negative space and I'm sharing that I'm in a negative space, it just is a it's like a contagious thing that I just don't want to make other people feel negative too. So I tend to just kind of keep it to myself. But the unfortunate side effect of that is that it actually does become contagious because people know that you're in a bad mood and they want to help, but you won't help anyways, you get the picture. So just making sure not to repress those negative states and talking about them as they come up. And as always, remaining open to new experiences, new relationships. I, it's really important to feel like I'm a part of something and I struggle with that. I often feel like I'm an outsider and I and I, I, I tie this back very much to mm, my, my, my family of origin and how I'm being the youngest and being so much younger than my siblings that I was just often left to myself. And I just want to make sure that I feel like I'm a part of something. And I know that I am. And I know that I have these relationships in my life that I want to just continue to nurture. And continuing to fight that challenge of being an introvert. Because it's so easy just to kind of hold myself up and, and, and not put myself out there. So instead, finding common ground and ways to be social with people. Because I know that I have a lot to offer, I think folks and I want to try to do that and then finally the big one I think for this next year before my birthday before my 42nd birthday is going to be moving and um, I have a list of, of, of things that I need to do be doing as we move towards uh, eventually relocating including making sure that we're making uh, sound financial decisions downsizing all of the stuff that we have in the house breaking these big tasks into smaller bite-sized tasks uh, making sure to stay optimistic and excited when things can definitely feel overwhelming and like impossible because moving not just out of this house and out of this city and out of this state, but to a whole other state, it, it, it's, it's a tricky thing and it's a lot and figuring out how to do it. It's, it's, I, I we have no guide for this, uh, because it's new for us. So we're figuring it out and just always remaining flexible with that because 
it's going to be tricky and people are going to get tired and frustrated and scared and lonely and sad as we rip our home. That's not a good word. As we move our home to someplace new, we're going to have to figure it out together. So that's my year in review, my, my 41st year in review. It was a good year, actually. I think 41 is a good one. And uh, I think working on 42 is, is already starting off great. I feel secure. I feel loved. And I feel as if I am open to what the universe has to offer. And I, I can't really ask for much more than that. So thank you for spending some time with me as I reflected on my past year. <laughs> new Year's part two, I guess. It's not really a new year, but whatever. However, I am curious how you celebrate your birthday. Or if you don't, what do you do instead? Do you want people to surprise you with a party? Or would you rather just consider the continuation of your experience here in this existence? And this reminds me, actually, uh, the one time Eva threw me a surprise birthday party and I about died at, because we lived in our old townhouse and it was not a very big space. But Eva invited everybody that I knew, <laughs> everybody that we knew. And I walked to the front door of that townhouse and there were so many people. They were crowded into the hallway. They were like popping out of the kitchen. They were basically falling down the stairs to greet me. And they all shouted surprise. And I was just in, in pure shock. And uh, I my eyes were big. And I, just, I remember telling him, I was like, I got to go. I got to go. And I, I went up the stairs and I shut the bedroom door. And like, I don't really remember what happened because I was in shock, but I needed to be alone. So I was in our room. I came down eventually and it was an amazing party. It was great. I just, I don't do well with surprises like that. I've tried to surprise Eva a few times, but Eva's just too good at sensing when there's a plan afoot and uh, snooping out the details. So as I've gotten older and my mental and physical age have more or less synced up, uh, I find myself just being satisfied with an amazing slice of Eva's cheesecake. That's it for this episode. I know it's a little bit it was a little bit messier than usual, but it was fun also. So thank you for for joining me. If you enjoyed this content, please like and share it. You can find it on social media or at the website benlosslives.com. I still have a few stickers available, and if you'd like one just reach out with your information and I'll get it in the post to you. If you have comments, questions or suggestions for future episodes feel free to leave them on social media or you can email them to binlos at binloslives.com or leave a voice message via the speakpipe app at binloslives.com if you are interested in supporting future projects by becoming a member you can find the show on patreon i look forward to our next conversations